So again, welcome everyone to the FEMCOM monthly seminar. Today's presentation will be on self-harm and Nina Lutz will be our speaker today. Nina is a third year PhD candidate in the University of Cambridge Department of Psychiatry who has researched non-suicidal self-injury for seven years. Nina noticed an overwhelming yet unacknowledged gender bias in the academic literature while writing both her undergraduate and master's dissertation on the etiology of self-harm, and her doctoral work is the first to directly ask why self-harm is more common in women. Uh, with that being said, over to you, Nina. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the chance to come and present today. Um, we're having some slight issues with the slide sharing, so um, I'll be just kind of saying next slide as we go through, um, because Young Cho is the one sharing her screen instead of me. Um, but yes, today I'll be sharing some of the completed work from my dissertation, which applies a critical feminist lens to the field of self-harm research to address questions about gender and self-injury. My research uses statistical methods to unpick the etiology of self-harm, which I consider to be like the root causes and the internal emotional experiences that are driving the behavior. But I'm also really interested in the broader historical context of this work. So where did our ideas come from and how has the literature that I read been shaped over time? So in this talk, I'll start by providing some of that historical context before presenting quantitative work from the first chapter of my dissertation, which explores alternative explanations for why self-harm is more common in women. Brief content warning, as the title suggests, I'll be discussing self-harm um, and how it's been written about in the academic literature, including some mentions of stigmatizing language used to describe people who self-harm. Next slide. So to start, what do I mean by self-harm? It's a broad term that people use in a lot of different ways. When I'm writing papers or presenting at conferences, I use the academic term non-suicidal self-injury or NSSI, which is defined as the direct and deliberate damage of the body without suicidal intent. That's a bit jargon heavy. So for this talk, I'll be using the more familiar term self-harm to describe the act of hurting your body on purpose for reasons other than trying to end your life, often by cutting, burning, or hitting yourself or punching objects. This is a narrow definition, which excludes other behaviors that people may themselves view as self-harm such as over-exercising, binge eating, or using drugs. Next slide. People hurt themselves for a range of reasons. Oops, sorry, yep. People hurt themselves for a range of reasons, um, but in general, self-harm is used to cope with unwanted, overwhelming feelings. People most often describe hurting themselves to alleviate negative emotions, such as sadness and frustration, to punish themselves, or to get rid of upsetting thoughts and suicidal urges broadly using physical pain to reduce psychological pain. Next slide. Now, self-harm is a gendered behavior, by which I mean that the topic is layered with gender-based stereotypes about who self-harms and why. It just takes a quick Google search to pull up countless media headlines portraying self-harm as something that girls do. The media does love to sensationalize research, um, I especially, I guess, love to hate uh, this headline from six months ago, where is the vaccine to stop the self-harm epidemic among teenage girls? But this is the type of attention grabbing messaging that gets shared on social media and influences the general public's understanding of self-harm. Next slide. Perhaps you recognize that you hold this gendered assumption yourself. The stereotype is so prevalent, including among psychologists and researchers, that when the self-injury research group at Cornell University published a list of the top misconceptions about self-harm, the number one myth on the list is that only females self-injure. But where did this idea come from? How did we end up with the widespread belief that self-harm is a female behavior? And what are the underlying assumptions about women which prop up the stereotype? Next slide. Fortunately, these questions have been the subject of study by academics in the medical humanities and feminist history of psychology, whose writing takes us back through the body of academic literature that has constructed our current understanding of self-harm. 
My brief overview of this historic literature comes from these four publications here on the slide, which provides some interesting context for my own research. Next slide. So these authors trace the origin of our literature to the late 1960s, when the first academic symposium on self-harm was held at a private psychiatric hospital in the US. There, the small number of male psychologists who were writing about self-harm at that time presented their work characterizing a new syndrome of self-cutting among their female patients. The symposium discussion paper starts by commenting on the newness of this topic, writing that, quote, it is remarkable that the literature dealing specifically with this syndrome has been almost nil prior to this year. Though self-harm made earlier appearances in a handful of case studies, this was the beginning of it being studied in an academic context. And then straight away the paragraph, the authors characterize self-harm as a female behavior. They write that the syndrome of impulsive self-mutilation occurs predominantly in young attractive females and explain that this is because self-harm simply follows from normal feminine masochism. So from its earliest appearance in the literature, we see self-harm described as something that women do because they are women. When this was written, Freudian psychoanalysis was still very much in practice. And so for the remainder of the paper, the authors go through all sorts of psychosexual interpretations of these women's unconscious reasons for hurting themselves. The perspectives of the people that they are writing about are notably absent. Next slide. Around the same time, we see several other papers define the typical self-harming patient as young and female. In three different papers from the late 60s and early 70s, they describe that the typical patient is an attractive, intelligent, unmarried young woman who is either promiscuous or overly afraid of sex, young, attractive, intelligent, even talented, and on the surface socially adept woman who generally appear normal, except when periodically overwhelmed by inner emotional tensions, and an attractive, intelligent young woman but a wanderer who forms impaired relationships and often seeks fulfillment in promiscuous sex, alcohol, and drugs. There's a lot of concerning stuff going on in these sentences here, including the male psychiatrist emphasis on their patients being attractive, which is of course just giving away that they are attracted to their patients. Um, and the fact that the people they're writing about come from the very narrow slice of society of people with access to psychiatric care in the 1960s. But those are kind of whole other talks that I don't have time to get into here. Setting all that aside, this common practice of describing the hypothetical average patient portrays what may be the most common demographic characteristics as the only demographic characteristics affected by self-harm. Because it's important to note that even in these early studies, not all of the patients were women. Each study mentioned male patients who self-harmed, but removed them from discussion because they were in the minority. Next slide. We can see this in that first symposium discussion paper, which briefly mentioned male patients and stated that, quote, it might be informative to study that small, neglected group, the perhaps not so attractive male cutters. However, no one took up this call to study men who self-harm, and instead we saw a proliferation of studies focusing on women. Next slide. The historical analysis papers I've drawn from describe the ongoing looping effect, which has entrenched these early misogynistic depictions of self-harm in the modern literature. That even though we no longer cite these early papers from the 60s and 70s, and researchers today have probably never read them or even heard of them, we continue to reproduce the same stereotyped understandings that they first presented. We started 60 years ago by depicting self-harm as a female behavior. Subsequent research was, was therefore carried out in female samples. And this then reinforced the initial belief that self-harm is predominantly experienced by women because all of the research is just being done with women. I really like how Chris Millard put it in his paper, Making the Cut, also great name for an article. Um, he wrote, historical roots of a behavioral pattern are disguised by its success. The behavior becomes not only self-evident, but self-sufficient without a need for history. I've seen this over and over in the modern literature, citing past female-only work to justify excluding men from their study, 
and calling for hypothetical future research to consider the experiences of men, which has not materialized. Next slide. So we know that there is a pervasive and historically entrenched gender bias in the self-harm research, which needs to be addressed. We now have to consider the underlying gendered assumptions which prop up the stereotype. What beliefs about women's reasons for hurting themselves have become entrenched through a similar ongoing looping effect? Next slide. Those historical analysis papers address this as well. And one of the things they point to is the portrayal of self-harm as impulsive and as an individual failure of these women to control their self-destructive urges. The underlying assumption is that, of course, women self-harm because women are emotional and they lack self-control, unlike men. The stereotype that women are emotional and men are rational is deeply ingrained in society, including certainly in the male psychiatrists who were developing theories to explain self-harm 50 years ago. Next slide. Let's look again at that first academic symposium. It's right there in the title, Impulsive Self-Mutilation. Next slide. They write that, quote, the act may be carried out at any moment and typically cannot be anticipated or forestalled. However, this sentence seems to be more of a reflection of their lack of understanding of self-harm, of this perplexing female behavior, than the reality of how self-harm is experienced. It's not a random act that can happen at any moment. It's a way of coping with overwhelming feelings. But remember, these uh, these authors' Freudian analyses of self-harm come from them studying their patients from a position of power and authority over their patients, and not from them seeking to learn about their patients' lived experience. Next slide. As Sarah Naomi Shaw writes in her historical analysis, the early literature betrays the psychiatrists' fear and confusion about self-harm and the negative attitudes they held towards their patients. This is also when we start to see self-harm described as manipulative and attention-seeking, which are also gendered terms. Perhaps if these men had spent some time speaking with their patients from a place of respectful curiosity, they would have had a better understanding of the emotional context in which self-harm occurs, of its use as an effective coping strategy, rather than depicting it as perplexing and irrational. Next slide. But alas, the language of self-harm as impulsive remains prevalent. Jumping ahead to 1988 and to the publication of the article, Female Habitual Self-Mutilators. This article remains one of the most highly cited papers in our field, published by arguably the originator of the contemporary literature on self-harm, the American psychiatrist, Dr. Armando Favaza. Right in the abstract, he again describes the typical subject as a young white woman and states that her decision to self-harm is impulsive and that she is unable to control her self-mutilative behavior. In the body of the article, he writes that, quote, the more contact we, we have with the habitual self-mutilators, the more we are impressed by their impulsiveness. Next slide. And jumping ahead again to the present day, impulsivity remains highly studied within the field of self-harm. A quick search on PubMed brings up thousands of articles and you can see in the graph of publications by year that it received increasing attention in recent decades. Next slide. So now we've kind of gone through the timeline and reached what is the starting point of my own work. I first entered the field of self-harm research about six or seven years ago during a clinical research placement on an inpatient unit for teenagers struggling with depression and self-harm. These are mostly teenagers who were uh, receiving psychiatric care immediately after making a suicide attempt. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on impulsivity and self-harm. It was a project that was kind of assigned to me. And then I came to Cambridge to do an MPhil in psychiatry where I again wrote a dissertation about impulsivity and self-harm. I didn't question the premise that self-harm is a poorly thought out maladaptive behavior that mainly teenage girls do. That was the opening paragraph of many of the papers I was citing and I reproduced that language in my own work. But as I got further into my PhD, I started to wonder where these ideas came from. I'd stumbled across some papers from the 90s and the early 2000s, which I felt were pretty shocking with how they wrote about people who self-harm, but I didn't know anything about the origin of the literature or honestly the origin of my own research topic, 
which early in my PhD was still focused on impulsivity. But I had access to this data set of young adults who had answered a range of different questions about their mental health. And so late one night, working from home during the pandemic, um, I had this idea that maybe I could test why it was that women in the sample were reporting much higher rates of self-harm than the men. Is it because the women are more impulsive? Is it something to do with the way that they are experiencing emotion or responding to distress? This wasn't part of my proposed PhD project, and I really didn't know how to go about even statistically testing this. I'd never seen anything like it in the literature, either in terms of methods or the research question. Why is self-harm more common in women? It seemed like such a glaring omission that I had to just give it a go and see where I got. And I'm really glad I did because I ended up making a total shift in my research during the second year of my PhD, which led now to a dissertation that I'm really excited to be able to contribute to my academic field. Next slide. So first, my research question is predicated on an assumption that self-harm actually is more common in women. And I need to acknowledge that that might not be the case. A number of more recent studies have found similar rates of self-harm across men and women. And so the literature has started to question whether it's even true that girls are more likely to self-harm than boys. Next slide. We don't have a way to fully overcome the gender biases, which at this point are just baked into the research on self-harm in a variety of ways, which probably means we're underestimating how common self-harm is in men. But the best we can do is look to meta-analyses, which synthesize a large number of research studies, which use different methods of assessing self-harm and draw from different types of samples and see what patterns emerge across all of that. This 2015 meta-analysis by Brezen and Schoen Labor included 120 different studies with a combined sample of nearly 250,000 people and concluded that yes, women are about one and a half times more likely to report self-harm than men. We see an overall estimated prevalence of about 26.4% in men and 33.8% in women. That's not a huge difference. Clearly it's still common in men, but it's enough for me to feel fairly confident that women are in reality more likely than men to self-harm. Next slide. And so now we can ask the question, why is self-harm more common in women? Based on my understandings of the largely emotion-based reasons why people hurt themselves, I thought there were two plausible explanations for women's higher levels of self-harm. Next slide. First, women may be more likely to experience the distressing feelings which lead to self-harm as a coping strategy. As I mentioned at the start, self-harm is most often used to alleviate negative emotions, including feelings of sadness, emptiness, hopelessness, and tension, which can be considered symptoms of depression and anxiety. There's a large body of empirical evidence that women are more likely than men to experience depression and anxiety. So higher levels of these symptoms in women, these negative feelings, may therefore explain their higher prevalence of self-harm. Next slide. Second, the prevalence gap may be due to patterns of gender differences in how men and women respond to distress. Emotion regulation encompasses the various ways that we manage our emotional responses. There are several layers to this, including the ability to recognize what you're feeling and to do things which help you feel better. Women tend to show more awareness and understanding of their emotions than men, but paradoxically, this increased attention can result in emotion dysregulation if they are ruminating on their feelings, which is the process of focusing on how bad you're feeling and the causes and consequences of those feelings without bringing in problem-solving strategies to improve the situation that's making you feel bad. People with high levels of emotion dysregulation are likely to experience their feelings as more intense and uncontrollable and may turn to self-harm to interrupt the escalating cascade of negative feelings. And so perhaps women are more emotionally dysregulated than men, and this could explain their higher rates of self-harm. Next slide. I believed that those two emotion-based explanations were the most likely but given the historical assumptions about women who self-harm being impulsive and my pre-existing research focus on impulsivity, 
I wanted to clarify its role in the gender prevalence gap. Impulsivity is a really like complicated, multifaceted psychological construct, but it broadly describes tendencies to do things without thinking through the consequences, to prioritize short-term rewards over long-term goals, and to do risky things because you enjoy the thrill. So if we believe that self-harm is irrational and attention-seeking and the result of poor self-control, as the early writers did, then yes, we might assume that people who self-harm are more impulsive than people who don't. However, empirical research, including my own work, my own master's dissertation, hasn't really supported this. Next slide. We primarily measure impulsivity in one of two ways, either with questionnaires asking people how they tend to behave or with neurocognitive assessments, which are essentially simple computer games that measure different ways that your brain process information, things like your reaction times and the types of mistakes that you make. There's a large body of research behind the development development of these neurocognitive computers, which are thought to give more objective measures of impulsivity than questionnaires do. They're measuring how your brain is working, so they're less susceptible to bias than simply asking somebody questions about themselves. Next slide. At this point, research has kind of concluded that these objective neurocognitive measures are not associated with self-harm. Next slide. Evidence is more mixed for the questionnaire measures of impulsivity, but it seems that the general types of impulsivity, such as tendency for risk-taking, lack of follow-through on difficult tasks, tendency to do things without planning, are only weakly associated with self-harm. And those associations largely disappear when you control for other self-harm risk factors, such as uh, childhood abuse. Next slide. The one facet of impulsivity that is consistently associated with self-harm is self-reported emotion-based impulsivity, which describes a tendency to react without thinking when you're upset, possibly doing things that you later regret. This type of impulsivity falls under the umbrella of emotion dysregulation, and it's the most conceptually related to self-harm. And so I thought that, yeah, it's plausible that this greater tendency to react impulsively when you're upset might contribute to higher rates of self-harm in women, still falling within my kind of second proposed explanation of gender difference in emotional response. But I also tested uh, these non-emotional types of general impulsivity in my analyses, uh, primarily with the hopes of disproving the assumption that women are self-harming because they're generally impulsive. Next slide. I investigated these different explanations in a sample of 996 young adults aged 18 to 33 who are part of a longitudinal study on young people's mental health that's taking place in my department. The data I analyzed were collected in summer of 2020 as part of an online survey about mental health during the pandemic. Next slide. Gender was assessed in a limited way with the question, what is your gender? And the three answer choices, male, female, or other. Since my research question focuses on the gender prevalence gap between men and women, I excluded the seven participants who did not identify as male or female, leaving me with 360 men and 629 women. Next slide. Self-harm history was assessed with a screening question from a validated questionnaire which asked, have you ever tried to hurt yourself on purpose without trying to kill yourself? For example, things like burning, cutting, or scratching yourself. As expected, we see that women in the sample are substantially more likely to report self-harm than men. Uh, odds ratio of about two, 2.43, um, twice as likely to self-harm as men. We asked about self-harm at any point in their life, as well as self-harm within the past year, and we see that the prevalence of lifetime self-harm here is 37% for women and 19.4% for men, and the prevalence of past year self-harm is 14.5% for women and 7.8% for men. Next slide. My analyses looked at three questionnaires that the participants had filled out. The 10 question Kessler psychological distress scale, which generates a single score reflecting the severity of anxiety and depression symptoms in the past month. The 18 question difficulties with emotion regulation scale, which generates a total score reflecting the tendency to experience emotions as overwhelming and uncontrollable. And the 20 question UPPSP impulsivity questionnaire, 
which generates five subscales measuring different types of emotional and non-emotional impulsivity. Next slide. To tease apart the relationship between these traits and self-harm, I used the statistical approach of mediation and moderation analyses. A mediator explains how variables are related to each other. It statistically accounts for the association between your dependent and independent variables. For example, I expected to find that women report higher levels of distress than men, and that this explains their higher rates of self-harm. A moderator affects the strength or the direction of the relationship between variables. Here, I'm testing whether the relationship between these traits and self-harm is different for men and women. For example, I also thought that at the same level of psychological distress, women would be more likely to self-harm than men. And these mediation and moderation analyses are not mutually exclusive. I expected to find a combination of effects which each partly explained higher prevalence of self-harm in women. My analyses only tested associations with past year self-harm, not lifetime, since it's conceptually important to relate recent measures of mental health to recent behavior. It's not, uh, it's not quite as logically sound to relate depressive and anxious symptoms from the past month to self-harm that may have happened 10 years ago. But this is, again, just cross-sectional data. Next slide. The first step of analysis was to figure out which of these seven questionnaire scores or seven psychological traits were contenders as possible explanatory variables. To do this, I ran a series of univariate binary logistic regressions to separately test their associations with self-harm and with gender. So which of those questionnaire scores were significantly higher in people who have self-harmed in the past year than those who haven't, and which are significantly different between men and women? Any trait significantly associated with self-harm would be tested in a moderation analysis to find out whether its association with self-harm is different for men and women. Any trait significantly associated with both self-harm and gender would be tested in a mediation analysis to find out whether it contributes to different levels of self-harm in men and women. Here's a simplified table showing the average scores reported by men and women and by people with and without past year self-harm. The highlighted rows show significant differences. So from this series of simple regressions, I've identified three variables to test in mediation analyses and six variables to test in moderation analyses. Next slide. It's always necessary to consider potential confounding variables that we might have to control for in our analyses. The main one here is the effect of age. Past research has demonstrated that rates of self-harm decrease with age. Self-harm is most common in teenagers, and it's thought that most people stop hurting, their self, stop hurting themselves by late adolescence or early adulthood. So here, I needed to test whether the participant's age is related to their likelihood of having hurt themselves in the past year, and also, crucially, whether the gender prevalence gap varies with age. Perhaps men and women show diff like different trajectories of self-harm during young adulthood. If either of those tests were significant, I would need to control for age in my primary statistical analyses. Next slide. To check this, I ran a series of binary logistic regressions again, relating age to past year self-harm, testing the linear and quadratic interacting effects of gender. And unexpectedly, I found that rates of self-harm in this sample did not significantly decrease with age. Even though the graph certainly looks like there's a downward trend towards self-harm prevalence being lower at early 30s than it is at late teens, this effect was not statistically significant. The interaction between age and gender was also not significant. So the prevalence gap didn't significantly vary with age. And therefore I did not control for age in the remainder of my analyses. Next slide. So let's do some mediation analyses. On the left side here, we have three separate generalized structural equation models testing the three potential mediators. The solid arrows show significant pathways and the dashed lines show non-significant pathways. We can see that two of those diagrams have all solid lines and therefore are both statistical mediators. Those two are psychological distress, as hypothesized, and positive urgency which is the facet of emotion-based impulsivity describing the tendency to react impulsively when you're in a really good mood. On the right side, I've included both psychological distress and positive urgency into one model 
to kind of test which one comes out on top. And what we see is that only psychological distress remains significant. Next slide. I then ran a series of six binary logistic regressions testing the interaction between gender and each of those questionnaire scores that were significantly associated with self-harm. Next slide. Unexpectedly, all of the moderation analyses were non-significant. All of the traits were similarly, similarly, similarly associated with self-harm in both men and women. Next slide. So what do these results mean? Are women more likely to experience the distressing feelings that lead to self-harm? Do patterns of difference in how men and women respond to distress put women at higher risk? And does impulsivity explain why women are more likely to self-harm than men? Next slide. The results only supported that first explanation. Women reported significantly higher levels of psychological distress than men, and this statistically accounted for their higher levels of self-harm. Or put more simply, women are more likely to self-harm than men because they're more depressed and anxious. Next slide. There was no evidence to support that the prevalence gap is due to differences in how men and women respond to distress. Men and women reported similar levels of emotion dysregulation and negative urgency, which described the tendency to behave impulsively when you're upset. And at similar levels of psychological distress, men and women are similarly likely to experience self-harm. Next slide. There was also no evidence that general non-emotional impulsivity contributes to the gender prevalence gap. Women were not more impulsive than men and impulsivity was similarly associated with self-harm for men and women. Next slide. Taken together, these findings, I think, are really interesting. This is the first research to directly address the sexist stereotypes we see throughout the academic literature, and my results show that it's really not the case that women are more likely to self-harm because they're more impulsive and emotionally dysregulated than men. Self-harm is primarily used to cope with negative feelings, and women are at higher risk of self-harm because they experience more of those negative feelings than men do. So to understand women's higher rates of self-harm, we need to understand why they are more distressed than men. This falls outside of the scope of my own research, but there's an excellent body of feminist quantitative research on this topic, which points to a combination of psychological and biological risk factors that are more common in women, women's greater exposure to stress and trauma, including sexual violence, and structural gender inequality, which gives women less control over their lives than men. Next slide. It's also striking that the moderation analyses were all not significant. These risk factors are similarly associated with self-harm in both men and women. I really wasn't expecting that. I figured that because we have this societal assumption that self-harm is something that girls do, men would be less likely to turn to self-harm when they're distressed. But this isn't what the results showed. As I was digging into the literature trying to make sense of this, I came across the gender similarities hypothesis from Professor Janet Shibley Hyde. Her work is a fantastic example of the use of quantitative methods to address feminist issues. This is empirically supported theory. Based on her extensive meta-analyses, um, she concluded that across the majority of psychological domains, men and women don't differ at all. And where they do differ, the size of the effect is, is small. She asserts that the dominant approach of identifying the ways that we're different, of focusing our interpretation of results on that difference, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that reinforces sexist stereotypes and it obscures the reality that men and women are far more alike than we are different, including in how we experience emotion. My findings extend this theory to self-harm as an emotion regulation strategy and support that the etiology of self-harm is largely similar for men and women. This is in direct opposition to how self-harm has been written about for the past 60 years. But I think it's time for the field to shift its perspective in this way. We can't escape the gendered history of self-harm, and by not directly addressing it, we allow it to continue replicating itself in our work. Next slide. Finally, I wanted to note the basic fact that while self-harm might be more common in women and more common in teenagers, perhaps, 
It affects men too, and it often continues into adulthood. We can't continue to focus on the most common demographics affected by self-harm at the neglect of everybody else. We need future research to figure out whether everything we've learned about self-harm from mostly young female samples, does it generalize to other populations? Because our lack of understanding of how self-harm is experienced by people from different backgrounds or at different stages of their lives is holding us back from understanding how to support them. Next slide. So to that end, the remainder of my dissertation investigates gender similarities in the experience of self-harm. Chapter two is a replication of the study that I just shared with you in a larger and more diverse sample, which incredibly showed the exact same pattern of results. In chapter three, I look at the severity of self-harm and how it progresses. And in chapter four, I look at the specific reasons why men and women say that they hurt themselves. My analyses for these are ongoing, but so far the findings support that yes, men and women are far more alike than they are different on these measures. So stay tuned for that. Next slide. So thank you very much for listening. Um, here is my contact details, relevant funding information, and the list of co-authors on the paper, which should maybe be coming out at some point soon. <laughs> thank you so much.